So in this question, we have a graph that shows the height, Z, in meters. We've got time. And of course, we are doing our Oizerga analysis. Our origin is zero, zero. Y-axis is height, Z, X-axis is time. Again, both units, normal units. Uh, so therefore, any questions about Z and T, we will read off the graph. The gradient is delta Z over delta T, which is the velocity. And the area Z times T has units of meter seconds, which has no value. So the slope is going to give us the velocity and uh, reading values off will give us position time. So in, then we get to the question, another planet. That means it's not Earth and not G equals 10 meters per second squared. That's why that's important. It's in free fall from rest. So V0 equals zero. Um, function of time, acceleration due to caused by gravity. So what is the acceleration? So our definition of acceleration is where we might start is delta V over delta T, but we don't have any vo velocity values. And if we look at what we did with our Oizerga analysis, there's nothing about acceleration here. So that's a clue that we're gonna have to do something different. We go to our definitions, acceleration delta V over delta T. We don't have those, although we could obtain a, an average velocity here and an average velocity here and go about doing it that way. We could possibly do that, but let's move on to a different relation that we have with, with position and acceleration. Um, we look at our relationships. We've got V equals AT plus V0. Again, there's no position. And if we go to our relationship between position and acceleration, well, we have this equation. <clears throat> so... Um, we know that our instantaneous, if we pick this last point here, for example, um, we were going to use it in this equation, we'd have an instantaneous position of 3. Um, we are looking for the acceleration. We know this time is 0 0.5 seconds. The initial velocity we're given is 0, and the starting position is 5. So we have, bringing the 5 over, we have minus 2 is 1 half the acceleration times 0 0.25 which is better written as a fraction in this case for us doing our algebra. 0.5 squared, 1 half squared is 1 fourth. So you'll notice that's 1 eighth on this side. Cross multiplying that gives us minus 16 is the acceleration. That's our answer. We could go through and do a check just to see if we are correct. We could pick another point and say like, oh, at 0.3 seconds, the position should be about, oh, it should be about 4.3. Uh, 4.3 maybe, so we could do that equation, uh, z equals 1 half at squared plus z0, z0 we said was 5, and our acceleration we just figured out was minus 16, and if we plugged in for 0 0.3, we've got minus 8 times 0 0.09 plus 5, which is minus 0 0.72 plus 72 plus 5, which gives us about 4.28. And we estimated there would be about 4.3, so it checks if we felt we needed to do a check. Second question here, we've got an acceleration time graph, so we'll do our Oizerga analysis. The origin we see here is at zero move, we move across here four two zero six all the way down to zero to minus six so that gives us this location is our origin y-axis is an acceleration in normal units time in normal units and the things we'll be able to read off the graph are the axes acceleration and time the gradient is delta a over delta t which is the rate of change in acceleration which has the definition of jerk um, and our area is going to be A delta T. Now, the units of A are meters per second squared, and delta T will be in seconds, so that will give us meters per second. So therefore, the area will be delta V for this graph. And we can see that the acceleration is a constant minus 5. So it's accelerating in the negative direction at a constant rate. <clears throat> All right, so we've got a... Uh, uh, 
it released from rest near a planet's surface. So a planet's surface, like the last question, it's not G. It's not 10 meters per second squared. From rest, V0 equals 0. Uh, shown for the four seconds after it's released. Now, the fact that the acceleration is constant would match the behavior here on Earth, which would be a constant minus 10. C positive direction is considered to be upward, and negative is downward. So on this planet, if there were a tree, positive would be upward, negative would be downward. What is the displacement of the object after two seconds? So again, we come over to our Oizerga analysis. Displacement is not one of our choices, like the last one. So now we, the only thing we seem to know in this case are V0, and we know the acceleration, and we're given time. So that sets us at our equation z equals 1 half at squared plus v0t plus z0. And if we set the starting position at equal to 0, that drops out. We are told v0 is 0, so we're left with z equals 1 half at squared. So we have an acceleration of minus 5, and we want to know after 2 seconds. We want to be careful with this question if we're reading quickly because they give us two different times. And they're just saying the graph is for four seconds. They want to know the, <clears throat> the displacement after two seconds. So we have one-half times four times minus five. And that's minus two times minus eight. And it gives us a um, minus ten. Minus ten meters is the displacement it would experience. Our next question, 20th floor of a building. After one second, it's fallen one floor. So one second, one floor. The floors are evenly spaced. Assume air resistance is negligible. What floor would the ball fall in three seconds after it's released from the 20th floor? Well, we could look at this as a average velocity table. So we've got time, 0, 1, 2, 3. Our acceleration, which would be minus 10. And our instantaneous velocity, which is 0, minus 10, minus 20, minus 30. Our cumulative average velocity, minus 5, minus 10, minus 15. And our displacement, delta z. So again, how we obtain those values, um, the definition of average velocity is the displacement divided by the time. So therefore, delta z is the average velocity times the change in time. So average velocity times time minus 15 times 3 gives us minus 45. So after one second, it fell one floor. So one floor, we can see, is 5 meters. And so we could translate this to the number of floors. So 5 meters is one floor then 20 meters would be four floors. And 45 meters divided by five would be nine floors. So we're looking at seven to 10 floors. And again, what we did is we took this total displacement divided by 5 meters, which is one floor. So that would give us four floors, and that would give us nine floors. Now, looking at these numbers, our formula for displacement is 1 half at squared. So if in one second it went one floor, if we had three seconds, it would be nine floors. So if we put in one, and it ended up being one floor, then if we tripled this, tripling the time squared would be nine floors and we could of course certainly have done that that quick translation but we could also use an average velocity table or the formulas to calculate it question number four so we have this block that's moving there is a spring launcher with a ball inside it so it has, the block has a velocity v in that direction. The spring launcher has a velocity v in that direction. The ball has a velocity v in that direction. So all of these objects, the ball, the spring, the spring launcher, the block, all have the same velocity before this event happens, before the launcher happens. 
once the ball launcher launches, the ball still has this forward velocity such that when the plunger, when the ball comes back down, it will land inside the cup. Much like if you were in an airplane traveling at, say, 700 miles per hour at 30,000 feet altitude, and you were sitting in your chair, and you take a ball and you throw it upward in the air, it'll come right back down and land in your lap because the ball already has that initial velocity moving in the forward direction. It keeps that initial velocity. So when the ball reaches its maximum height, what will be the position of the ball relative to the spring launcher uh, directly above the spring launcher? They're trying to trick us there with our misconceptions. The last one here, we have a bowling ball, a bowling pin, excuse me. And so this is a great way to apply center of mass. So the center of mass might be there and there and there and there and there. And how I know that is, of course, if we take this bowling pin and reduce it to a point object, it would reduce to its center of mass. And I know its center of mass would move vertically along a straight line. So that's how I know where the center of mass would be. All right, so we've got to throw in vertical upper so it rotates, uh, moving upward at 10 meters per second. All right, the maximum height, but is it most nearly? All right, so this thing is fro being thrown upward. Now, what we know is its velocity changes by 10 meters per second every second. So if its V0 is 10 meters per second, after one second, its velocity will be zero meters per second because it will decrease 987654321 in exactly one second. So we know that's what would happen. What we then, we then know is that the average velocity would be five meters per second. Now the question it's asking us to determine the maximum height well, the maximum height, if its average speed is five meters per second, it's one second, it would be five meters. But that is not what they're asking. They're asking for an expression of the units, or to be expression of the formula in variables. And of course, you look at choices C and D, it says it cannot be determined, cannot be determined. Well, that's clearly false because we just determined it, five meters. So it definitely can be determined. So next, it comes down to the two formulas that we have, and there's two approaches we could take. One of those is dimensional analysis to look at the units, and the other one is to use the formulas directly. Dimensional analysis using the units can be a nice shortcut, and let me show you how. We know that the height needs to be in meters, so let's look at, evaluate these formulas. Velocity initial squared over 2g. Now, I'm leaving out the 2 because it has no units. So the units of velocity are meters per second, and the units of gravity are meters per second squared. So to resolve this, we write out meters squared per second squared. I have squared meters per second, and that is meters squared per second squared. And to divide by a fraction, we multiply by the reciprocals, second squared over meters. Notice the second squares, second squared are gone, and this meters is gone and that's gone, leaving us with the unit meters. So it looks like this is the, this is the answer. Now, if we try the other one, just for fun, meters per second squared divided by the quantity meters per second squared, that is going to be meters per second squared times second squared per meter squared, because the quantity meters per second is meters squared per second squared, and if we invert it, it's second squared per meter squared. Second squared's gone, this meter's gone, and that meter's left, so our answer, our units are one over meters. So that's how we could show that, and that's a very useful trick on many questions throughout the course. But how would we go about showing this with the formula? Well, with the formula, we can put in an equation where v equals at plus v0. And we know at the top, velocity is 0. The acceleration is g, and the t is 1 second. And the initial velocity is unknown. Oh, 10 meters per second, excuse me, it's 10 meters per second. And so we end up finding out that g is minus 10, which isn't a big surprise. It's not a big surprise. Now, if we go to our other equation, z equals 1 half at squared plus v0t plus z0, we have a z at the top that we're looking for. We have the acceleration g, time is 1, the initial velocity is unknown, and the time is 1, and z0 is 0. So we're left with z equals 1 half g plus v0. And 
you can see already, this is going to be a much more difficult way to go about solving this problem. The third way we can go about doing this is since we figured out the answer is 5, we could determine which of these will yield the right answer. So vi squared over g, vi we're told is 10, so 100 over 10 is 10. Uh, 2g, excuse me. Uh, 2g, so that's 20, and that gives us 5. So that does seem to give us the right answer. And if we use the other one, 2g over vi squared, that's 2 times 10 all over 100. So that's 20 over 100, or 1 fifth, which is not the correct answer.